$280 million right here. Who wants it? What's your name? Nick. Hi, Nick. I'm Paul. $280 million. That's the winning ticket for the Powerball Wednesday night. <laughs> what are you going to do with the money? Invest it back in my Amazon business. I like that. Invest it back in his Amazon business. Now, before you win, I have to warn you something. There are oftentimes things that happen to major lottery winners. In fact, many of them go bankrupt within five years. What percentage of major lottery winners do you think actually go bankrupt? 25, 35, 50%? 50? Some people say higher? You're right. It's actually, oops. Got to change these batteries. Can you hit it for me? No, I meant hit the laptop. Yeah. This isn't going to work. Can you slide the advance forward? One more time. It's actually 70%. Lewis, if you would do my slides for me, I'd appreciate it. All right, 70%, Nick. So that means what are your chances of having less money in a few years than you have right now after you win $280 million? Now, do you think you're going to be one of those 70%? No, absolutely not. How many of those 70% people thought, there's no way I'm going to be bankrupt after I won millions of dollars? Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think it's because of the decisions they made? Right. Yeah. Do you think they made good decisions? Or you think they made bad decisions? Bad decisions. Here's the point. And Nick, I want you to be one of the 30% who's happy in five years because you have lots of money. Right? Oftentimes, it's not how good our good decisions are that determine our success in business or life. It's how bad our bad decisions are. Now, let me ask you this. Am I the only one in the room that's ever made a bad decision? No, I see some head shaking. No, yeah, a few people, right? All right. The science of decision making actually shows there are certain reasons that we make bad decisions. And as Jeff mentioned, I study people who are at the top of their field, primarily in sports, in the NCAA. Oh, thank you, NCAA, but also professional sports, Olympic levels, and so forth. And one of the things that I noticed right away in our research is they're not any smarter than the rest of us. What they tend to do first and foremost is they avoid making really tragic decisions. So to help you in your decisions in business, let's take a look at the other way. Didn't work that way a minute ago. And some of the barriers to good decisions are reasons we make bad decisions. First and foremost is we are, have biases. Let me share one with you. All right. I'm at the University of Georgia. Go dogs, right, Caroline? Yeah. All right. And our arch enemy is the University of Florida. We have any gators in here? We have a couple. All right. So if one of those gators came to me for a job interview, I know two things about them. University of Florida. First, you have a good suntan. <laughs> Secondly, you have a very poor education. <laughs> Am I right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> we have a few dog fans in here. Not really. All right. So if I actually made the decision to hire or not hire you because you're a University of Florida graduate, I potentially am making a very bad decision because of my bias, right? And we all have biases. And so if you realize what some of your biases are, or you're about to make a decision and you ask yourself, is this bias in any way? And be honest with yourself, you're probably going to avoid a bad decision. Another reason we make bad decisions is we're unprepared. Sometimes we're given a situation, and I know this happens to all of you in your businesses, and you just don't have enough time, for example, to think things through or to gather the resources you need, or you don't have the skill set to really be able to do this. 
For example, let's take interviewing. I might not be able to have the skill set to do a good job. I'm unprepared as an interviewer to really pull out what I need from the interviewee. So I make a bad decision because I wasn't prepared for the situation. It could be a unique situation. I have never been there before. Do we have any people here from Houston? I mean, how about those poor people in Houston when that flood hit? They were unprepared for that because it was highly unique. The water had never risen that high. Or I think about the poor people in um, Hawaii right now fighting that volcano. I mean, think about how unusual that situation is. How do you prepare for that? You can't. So it's unique. You've never seen it before. And in your business, tell me this. Are things changing all the time? Yes. Just when you think you got it right, the technology changes. That's why I have graduate students. They help me figure that out. So it's unique. Right. You might have limited information. Jeff, you mentioned this this morning, and I thought you were spot on with that. You just don't have all the information you need. So you have to make a decision based on what you have. Ultimately, it may not be a right one. Now, if you look at those four things, some you can control and some you cannot. But be aware of them when you're making a decision. It really does help you to make avoid bad decisions. Now, let me share with you the bane of experts, the reason they make bad decisions. They're overconfident. I've seen this before. Right? Or you hear somebody say to you, I've been in this business 20 years. Well, actually, in our business, I've been in this business three years, which is a lot, right? Yeah. All right? And so I've seen it all, and I know what's coming. You hear that and be very careful because it's, go it's likely going to lead to a poor decision. They don't take enough time to analyze the situation. Now, there's one more reason we make bad decisions, and this is one that you can control, believe it or not, and it has to do with your emotions. And research says there are five emotions that really, really help us make bad decisions, and here they are. And I'd like you to think about some bad decisions you've made. Have you ever made a bad decision because you were angry? Yeah. Or you were fearful. Actually, what fear tends to do is make, stop us from making good decisions. I don't want to invest that money because I might lose it. And then you realize that, yeah, Amazon stock, if I bought it 10 years ago, you know, I wouldn't have to be in this room today. Yeah, right? Or sometimes we're very sad, or we're just disgusted and don't want any more to do with it. Or we feel guilty. My brother-in-law walks in for an interview. The guy's a jerk, all right? But I have to give him a job, right? Guilt if I don't, all right? Now, here's what happens physiologically that contributes to these bad decisions with emotions. This comes from a research study that we're currently doing with expert coaches. We want to know how they perform under pressure. So one of the things that we do is we take brain scans. And by the way, the, the technology for doing brain scans now is very simple. We have a band that goes around their head, and, and essentially it measures their brain waves. And if you look at this diagram right in front of you, it's the same brain. Right. On the left side, those two brains are highly emotionally charged. Right. We put them in situations that uh, increase both their fear and their anger at the same time. And I won't share that with you, but it was game time situations. Now, on the top, it's the alpha waves. By the way, it's the same on the right side. We have them in calm situations, same person. All right. The alpha waves on the top, is those are the brain waves that actually click into effect when we're trying to learn something. It's my hope right now that the brain waves you're most using are your alpha waves. Right? The, the bottom ones are um, the beta 2 waves, which are, if you will, deep level processing of thinking. Uh, beta 1 waves are simple things like, you want a cup of coffee, yes or no? That's a fairly simple question. All right? But if you want to say, OK, here's a coffee bean. In two days, I want you to produce a cup of coffee. All right? You're going to need your beta 2 brain. All right. Now, what the point is here is if you look at the left side, highly emotionally charged, the bright lights indicate the voltage level passing through your brain as those brain waves are firing. Very, very strong. Five, the red indicates five volts. Most of you probably know what that is from a small battery. In your brain, that's a lot. 
So when it's firing that fast and that powerful, that's why when you think about being angry, you feel a lot stronger, don't you? You also feel like you want to make this decision now, fast. It's a reaction. Right? And that's actually true for most emotions. All right, now, on the right, or, uh, yeah, the right side over here, it's calm. That's a normal, hopefully your brain is more that color right now, lower voltage. All right? So you're able to be more deliberative in your thinking. When you're highly charged, you cannot be deliberative. All right? Here's the second thing that happens. When this brain starts firing high red like that, it releases a hormone called hydrocortisone, uh, commonly known as cortisol. And here's what that does to the brain. By the way, it also releases a little insulin, which spikes up your, um, your insulin, or, um, yeah. Um, somebody just said it. Sugar. Yeah, it, it makes you stronger, actually. It makes your uh, abilities for your muscles to fire. Uh, adrenaline is, is what goes through your system. That's why when you see in emergency situations, people are able to lift cars up where ordinarily they can't. That's actually a true story. That's why you feel so powerful. You actually start sweating sometimes or you feel something deep in your gut. Right? It, it's a very strong, powerful thing. But here's what the cortisol does to your brain. Right? If you look at this part right here, that's right in here. In fact, if you would just touch your forehead right here. All right. That's your prefrontal cortex. There's no quiz at the end of this, so don't worry about that. Prefrontal cortex, that's where you do most of your deliberative thinking, your decision making, analytic decision making. All right. That's why it's also the thickest part of your skull, because your body's trying to protect that, because it's so important. But what happens is when you're highly emotional and that cortisol is in there, it actually suppresses your ability to fire neurons in that part of your brain. In other words, what the brain is doing is restricting your ability to make deliberative decisions. Why would it do that? For this reason. When you're highly emotionally charged, you're in a fight or flight situation. You either want to fight somebody because you're angry or you want to flee because you're fearful or something else. So your brain is saying, do not think. React and react strongly. And that's not a good recipe for a great decision. It may save your person um, in certain situations, but when it comes to making good decisions, not so much. All right. Let me share with you a little, I do some sports psychology with a couple of teams as well. Uh, let me share with you something that would help when you find yourself fearful or angry or whatever. I'm going to ask you to do something, but it will not be embarrassing. It won't be recorded, so please just bear with me. All right. First thing is you're, both, you're all sitting. If you would, put your hands on your, on your thighs all right, and close your eyes. What we've just done, closing your eyes, is you've cut down the amount of input to your brain. Now what I want you to do is breathe deeply through your nose and exhale out your mouth. One more time. And exhale out your mouth. Good. You probably feel a little lightheaded, don't you? OK, here's why. There's two ways the body gets rid of waste products. All right? One's through your digestive system. The other is through your respiratory system. What you just did helped calm your brain, and here's why. First, when we closed our eyes, you stopped input from going in visually. All right? So the brain shut that part down. All right? So it's starting to calm down already. Next, you concentrated on breathing, so you weren't thinking about the thing that made you angry. You got distracted, if you will. Then finally, the breathing exercise actually helped flush your brain of waste products, if you will, like the cortisol starts to wash out. Right? Through you can actually exhale it, believe it or not. And you probably felt calmer afterwards, a little lightheaded, but calmer. And now you're in a position to make a better decision. So whenever you feel that emotion spike up and you have to make an important decision, step out of the room. Take a couple of deep breaths. That's not myth. That is actually works. All right? Or if you can, wait 24 hours to make the decision if it's a really important decision. But calm that brain down. All right. Now, once you got the brain calm, does that mean you can make a good decision? No. It just means you're ready to make a good decision. So what do you have to do? 
there's actually two processes we use to make great decisions. One's called analytic decisions, and the other's called intuitive decisions. Yes, that's right. Intuition produces great decisions. And I'm going to explain both. But first, let's take a look at analytic decisions. All right. These are the ones that our society says produces great thinking. I wouldn't go that far. But it does produce good thinking. What do they require? First of all, they need, as Jeff was just saying, they need data. And they need detail. You need to be informed. You're not going to make a good analytic decision without a good amount of information. Will you always have everything you need? No. But you should have enough. Next, here's the process. It's a rational analysis. And it draws to a logical conclusion. Right? We use it for three things. We use it to solve problems. We use it to determine strategy. And yes, we can use it to predict the future. Today, you will learn how to predict the future. Right. Not only are you going to get $280 million, Nick, you're going to be able to produce and predict the future. You're having a good day. All right. Yes, we do these three things. And this is what I want to spend a little time telling you how to do this. All right, let's talk about problem solving. In studying these great coaches and also experts in their field, we realized they were really good at solving problems. And I'm looking out at an audience that I think are problem solvers. Don't you every day walk in and have problems to solve? Yeah. And the quality of those solutions directly determine how successful you will be in business which probably in some ways is related how successful you'll be in life. All right, so we were studying these great coaches, and I was, sitting at, I was actually sitting at home, and I was seeing two things. Um, here's what some coaches did, and here's what other coaches did. Here's what produced some really great results, and here's what produced, let's just say, not so great results. And I couldn't put my finger on exactly what the difference was. So we have any Sherlock Holmes fans in here? A couple, okay, my peeps, all right? I love Sherlock Holmes, especially reading Sherlock Holmes. So I was reading this story, and his uh, assistant is named Dr. Watson. And so Watson asks Holmes, what's the difference between the way you solve a case and the way Lieutenant Lestrade, his, if you will, colleague at Scotland Yard, who was a, a very incompetent detective, uh, how he solves problems? And Holmes laughed and says, you got to realize that the way Lestrade goes about solving a case is he uses backward thinking. And here's an example of backward thinking. We've all done it. You walk into a store and you see this jacket. Right? And you say, I got to have that jacket. Right? Now, you think you justify all the reasons you need this. I see some heads moving. Yes, you think this way, right? Yes, summer's coming up. It's a light jacket. It's a color that matches the season. It will go good with the shirt and the slacks that I have. So you buy the jacket. You take it home, or actually you can go online now and do that, and it arrives in the box. All right? You take it out, you put it on, and what do you determine? Yeah, I see the looks. Yeah. That, bad choice. All right? So if you're a guy, you hang it in your closet, hope to never see it again. If you're a woman, generally you're a little smarter and you send it back and get what you really need. All right? That's backward thinking. In other words, you make the decisions and then you try to justify it. So if you're ever in a situation where you're trying to justify a decision that you made, let that be a warning to you that, that it was a bad decision. And as long as you keep trying to justify it, you're just going to dig that hole deeper. Now, the opposite to that, and the way Holmes went about solving a case, was forward thinking. In other words, he would put all of the information together to form the solution. Because he realized what Lestrade was doing in trying to justify his decision, all the negative input, Lestrade would just ignore, not needing to know that. And when you do that, that's another reason your decision is going to be bad. So forward decision means that you actually move forward. All right. So let me give you an example. I need a jacket. Summer's coming up. So I look in my closet. What colors don't I have? I might look online. What styles are hot right now? All right. And then what are the prices? What's a good price to pay? And I may go to a few stores, try some on, see how they look. Maybe ask a few other people for opinions. In other words, now I'm starting to gather the data that's going to help me make the right the solution. And that's 
forward thinking. So when you do, are doing analytic thinking, you follow that process. Let me get really specific. All right. The first step is define the problem. Now this research comes from the University of Pittsburgh. We got, I know we have a couple of Pennsylvania people in here. Anybody from Pittsburgh? What a great city, love that place. University of Pittsburgh has a Center for Cognitive Studies. They do some brilliant work. And they did this research with um, data analysts and software developers, and they also did it with uh, x-ray technicians. And they found the same thing applied. We've done it with coaches, and we, again, we found this. What we found is that the really great decision makers, the really great problem solvers, spend more time defining the problem. Poor decision makers spend little time defining the problem. They assume they already know what the problem is. So here's the difference. The experts know if you don't get the problem right, you have no hope of ever getting the solution right. So ultimately, they solve the problem faster, but they spend more time defining it. Next, you got to recognize the factors that are causing the problem. If you're going to solve a problem, you got to know the causes, not the symptoms, but the actual causes. Oops. Come on. There we go. And here's the second thing that differentiates great decision makers. They identify possible solutions. Notice that's plural, solutions. Poor decision makers will usually go with the first solution they come up with. Great ones say, OK, that is a very viable solution. But let's see if we can come up with another one. And then another one after that. And maybe even another one after that. And here's what gives them the advantage. First, if the first one doesn't work out, they scrap it almost immediately, and they implement plan B. They've got it ready to go. Or here's another thing they discovered. If we take plan A and plan C, put it together, that's better than any plan we've got. So you hear the term thinking outside the box. It's, it's actually a psychological term, and it is true. This is how they do it. They say, what other solutions work rather than let's jump on the first one? And that's generally going to lead to backward thinking, by the way. And then here's the last thing that happens. They implement the solutions, and then they evaluate them to see how good they are. And here's another difference. Experts are always thinking, can it be better? And if so, how do I make it better? Good performers, and I mean good performers, are always satisfied with the solution at hand. And so they don't really look to solve it again or, or improve what it is they're doing. All right, how about strategies? Most of you, I know all of you, are uh, entrepreneurs. You have your own business. So strategic thinking is very important to your success in business, yes? So here's the three things that you need to think about in terms of strategic thinking. The next time you're really thinking deeply, doing a deep dive into your business, first of all, set your priorities. What we really mean by this is, where do you want to go? What's your vision? As my friend Ken Futch said, it's, it's what's the why of your business? Why are we doing this? And I bet that meaning is deeper than just to make a lot of money. Because if you do the things right, the money's going to come. Or I can give you a winning lottery ticket. That also lets you know where to commit the resources. If you know the journey, then you're going to know the transportation you need. What resources are you going to need? And then finally, it lets you direct your actions. And anything that isn't going to lead you to your priorities or isn't a priority, you shouldn't be attending to. And I bet many of you, I fight this all the time, are spending a lot of your day on things that just aren't priorities. And when you do that, you're wasting time. The great ones don't do that. What's my priority? What resources do I need to give to it? And what actions do I take? Do not start this way when you're thinking about your business. Do not. What do I do next? Don't start with the actions. Start with the vision. Start with the priority. And I know that sounds simplistic and it sounds kind of uh, hoity-toity. It's not. What are your commitments? That's one of the things I really like about Seller Labs. You know, you saw Jeff put that up there. That's their values. That drives their decision making. It drives their strategy. And when you got that, 
you've got a lot going for you in terms of strategy. All right, let's talk about people who make great strategic decisions. What do they do? All right. First of all, they change batteries often. No, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff mentioned this. They use real-time information. Think of it this way. If you're using last year's data to try to solve tomorrow's problems, you don't have much of a chance. What's happening now and what are the trends? That's what you're looking for. The freshest information you can get. Right? So you use that. You also integrate, you integrate your decisions. You realize that if you make a personnel change or an action change, it will influence your resources. So you realize that certain decisions are going to drive other decisions. Most, most of you sell products in your, in your Amazon store. And so if you're going to add a new product, how does it affect the other products in your store? Or if you're going to get rid of one and slip in another one, what, how does that change your mix or your brand or whatever it might be? So you recognize the decisions are integrated. This is a great one. Come on. Consensus with qualification. Let me give you an example. Nick's won $280 million. So Thursday morning, by the way, Nick's a good decision maker, and he realizes $280 million, I need a strategy. I also need a Porsche. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little indulgence, Nick, all right? But I need a strategy, all right? And I'm not, you're not a financial whiz, are you? No. I'm not. Right. So I need some opinions. All right. So that's consensus, but I need qualification. Here's the qualification. Nick's going to conform, uh, organize a group of people, and some of you do this, all right. and you're going to get their opinions. I want to know what you would do. What do you think we ought to do with $280 million? I bet you got some ideas, don't you? Yeah. And I'll pay you for your time. No, not $279 million, but I'll, I'll pay you for it. All right. So you get these uh, informed opinions, and you try to reach a consensus. But here's the qualification. The qualification is, ultimately, it's Nick's decision. It's your responsibility, and you don't shy from that. Anybody that makes excuses, I made a bad decision because I got a bad advice, no. Ultimately, it's your responsibility, your decision. And that's the qualification. So you try to get as many informed decisions or information as you can, but ultimately realizing it's your decision. And what you say to people is, I appreciate the input you got. I listened to you carefully. I decided to go in a different direction for these reasons, but I do appreciate the information you gave. Most people know when you sincerely listen to them, and that's all they're looking for. They realize it's not their decision. It's yours. It's your business. It's your money, Nick. All right. And then here's a great one. If you're considering strategies for your business, I'm sure all of you are thinking about, well, what are other people similar to me doing? What other business plans, if you will, are other people using? And so there's alternatives to what you do. So consider the alternatives simultaneously, not independently. Independently would mean like, for example, I look at your business model and I say, okay, I like this, this, and this. I don't like this, this, and this, so I'm not going to use it. I kick it out. I look at yours. I like yours, so I'm going to go with it. I look at yours, not so much. Don't like it. It's not the best way to do it. Let me give you an example. Let's say you were renovating your house, and I own an art gallery. And you came to me and you said, Paul, I really like oil paintings. I particularly like oil paintings that have kind of a calm setting. I love sun and bright lights. And I say to you, I think I've got some paintings for you to consider. Here, take this one home. Hang it up for a week or two. Bring it back in a week or two, and I'll give you another one. Tell me how you like it. Good? All right, two weeks, you come back. I'll give you another one. Take it home, put it on the wall, look at it, bring it back. I'll give you a third one. Take that home, look at it, you bring it back. Now I ask you, which one would you want? By the way, most of you probably know what the data say. You're probably going to go with option two, door number two. Because the first one, you're a hypercritical. Number two, you recognize that. By the way, you'll forget the errors in number two. When you hit number three, number three, you'll probably like that would be your second choice. No, consider them simultaneously. What if I gave you all three paintings at the same time, take them home, put them up, 
and automatically you know which one you want, don't you? Because when you can compare things side by side, they illuminate the positives and the negatives for you in ways that you can't do independently. So consider strategic thinking simultaneously. All right. Predict the future. That's what we're all trying to do, right? Well, if you're going to use analytic decision making, you need two things. One is data points, and the other is contributing factors. And I'm going to illustrate both of these. Let's take data points first. If you look on the vertical line, that's a happiness scale. And it goes from one to six. All right? Rate on one to six how happy you are in life. All right, boom. And by the way, it's just more than one question, but that's the scale. Down here, it's how often or satisfied you are with certain things. For example, job satisfaction. On a scale of one to nine, how satisfied are you in your job? On a scale of one to nine, how satisfied are you with your marriage? All right. On a scale of one to nine, how often do you attend church? And by the way, you'll see that line kind of, and I don't know, I didn't do this study. I can't explain why they picked these variables. Just go with the research, if you will. But you notice that church uh, kind of flattens out after six days because um, there's only seven days in the week. <laughs> so um, not every research is perfect. So all right, I was talking to um, Danica and Maria last night. Where are you? ladies. Oh, right here in front. All right. And they were talking about their daughters and going to college and decisions that they have to make and so forth. How many of you are parents? All right. How many of you had parents? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. All right. Did your parents ever try to give you advice? Or as a parent, do you ever try to give your kids advice? If you're trying to give your kids advice, you know how tough it was for your parents, right? Yeah. All right, so if you are going to give your parents or your kids advice, Danica and Marie, you know, what would you give them? Well, here's something that the research says. Right? The most important thing that you have to pick in life is your partner. Because if you're not happy in your marriage, you're not going to be really happy in life. If you love your marriage, your happiness is going to soar. That's what the research says. Is it true in all cases? No, research isn't like that, but that's the trend. All right? Second most important thing, job satisfaction. Pick a job that you feel deeply satisfied with. Not one that earns you necessarily a lot of money or not, but something you find deeply satisfying. That's number two. And hey, once in a while, go to church. It won't hurt. All right, those are data points. So when you can plot a trend, all right, you see a trend going up or you see a trend going down, that helps you, quote unquote, predict the future. All right. Next, contributing factors. Right. For example, if you were going to, let me just explain this. Uh, this was done in 2017, and they wanted it in network preferences by generation. And so they looked at Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, Google Analytics, and YouTube. And what they found, for example, with the baby boomers, let's start there, almost exclusively, a little over 60% of baby boomers, their social media of choice, or their network of choice, is Facebook. Right? You can see that a little bit of Twitter, they never heard of Instagram, all right, or Snapchat. All right? Or pin interest is also low. So if you were trying to market to these people, by the way, Seller Labs did a great job. No, with the Facebook page, look at that. They hit it. They nailed it. Right? They knew who was going to look at it, everybody. Now, if you were doing a marketing with millennials, well, about 30% of millennials, their first choice in a uh, network is Facebook. But they also like Instagram and Snapchat. So you would also have to relative, uh, relate some of the information, marketing information, to those venues. Right? So if you were doing a millennial campaign, you would have to look at these factors. And the more of those factors you put into it, the greater your success is going to be. Right? Again, with the baby boomers and even the Gen Xers, probably very limited in other fields, you know where to concentrate. 
So what contributing factors is, you can predict the success of something based on what factors you're using, what factors contribute to the success. And let me give you a real good example. Let's say I was going to buy from your website or on Amazon your products. Do you have any idea what's going to cause me to purchase your product? What factors do you have to appeal for me to hit that click button where you, you get my credit card information and my cost? And you're shipping something to Athens, Georgia. Right? Probably you know some of the things. Price is going to be one of them, right? right? Probably the, the picture that you put up is another. What else is going to make me attracted to your site? Yeah, okay, so the more of those factors that you understand, the better you can predict how successful your website is going to be, how successful your store is going to be. Now, if you can put that in with the data points, you've really got something. All right, so that's analytic thinking. Right? Helps us solve problems, helps us set strategy, helps us predict the future. But that's only one type of thinking. I love this quote from Albert Einstein. Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind, or if you will, the analytic mind, is a faithful servant. Think of, let me read that again. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Because my guess is your entire life, you've been ta thought, taught to think things out, gather all the data, do all the analysis, and that's going to help you solve all your problems, predict all the future, and set your strategy. No, it's part of it. What our research is showing is that great decision makers often have a healthy uh, distribution of intuitive thinking. I did a presentation a few years ago in, in Phoenix. I was talking to sport coaches. And afterwards, a, a, a woman came up to me and said, I want to thank you. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name. And she says, I'm Linda Volstead. Now, anybody here ever hear, hear of Linda Volstead? All right, let me tell you who Linda is. Linda was, she's now the Associate Athletic Director at Arizona State University. Right. As a college coach, she won seven national championships. That's remarkable. All right. Not only that, at one time, she had put more players on the professional tour than any coach in history. Accomplished coach? Absolutely. So much so that in the last generation, in the 1900s, the Pac-10 Conference, it was called then, the Pacific Coast Conference, had two coaches that they named Coach of the Century, a male and a female. Uh, the football coach from uh, the University of Southern California became the male coach of the century. Linda was the coach of the century for women. So she came up to me afterwards, I was just blown away, and she said, I want to thank you. And I said, what could I have possibly said that, <laughs> that you didn't already know? She said, you know, all the success I had in life, or as a coach, I always hated talking to the press. She didn't seem all that shy to me. And I said, well, why is that? She said, because they always asked me, how did I make the decision to put this player in or take that player out or, or suggest to this player this particular strategy? And she said, I never wanted to tell, tell them the truth was my intuition told me that this was the right decision. And she said, in all of the great decisions I ever made, they were all intuitive decisions. And she said, what you said today was the science supported why I was successful. Now, am I saying intuition is the only way to go about it? No. But you've got to mix the two. And you've all have had intuitive decisions or feelings, haven't you? Let me share with you a little bit about it, and then I'll take you just through a brief exercise. All right. Some of you may have been familiar with this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman actually won the Nobel Prize in um, economics for that book or for that theory. Basically, what he was saying is the best economic decisions mix fast thinking, which is intuitive thinking, and slow thinking, which is in, uh, analytic thinking. You need the two to make great decisions. And that's what he's talking about. All right, so let's take a look at intuitive decisions. And I'm saying this because I know this is going to resonate with you. Resonate 2018. Hashtag resonate 2018. 
All right. First of all, intuitive feelings or thinking requires little or conscious, little effort or conscious thought. They just come to you, don't they? You just know something. So they're also very fast. You don't have to take time to think about it. They just are there. You're in a situation, all of a sudden you feel something's right to do. How do you know if it's any good? I'll tell you the one characteristic. Here it is. How confident are you? How strong is that feeling? And by the way, it may define conventional logic. You just know this is the right decision at this time. Go with your gut. It actually won't hurt you. All right, let me tell you a little bit about where it comes from. All right. It's a pattern recognition. It results from experience. You can actually learn intuitive decision making if you use it. Let me give you an example. If you've been in your house, the home you're currently occupying, for more than five, I'm going to say 10 years, and you haven't really arranged the furniture in your living room all that much, make that assumption, because that's experience. You know what it looks like. If we sent somebody to your house right now and they moved one table just two inches, just one table two inches, you would walk into that room and something wouldn't feel right. You wouldn't know what it was. Have you ever had that feeling? Yeah. All right. And you're not doing an analytic analysis. And that's why we often dismiss this. But what's happening is your brain is recognizing the pattern isn't the way it needs to be. The pattern's out of order. And that's what you're picking up on. And that's what intuition does. It puts a pattern together. So you need some experience in this. And again, you can learn it. So here's the difference. Your conclusions in intuitive decision making is based on impressions, recognition of patterns, not connecting or collecting data points. You're not putting a puzzle together. You're seeing a picture, a mosaic, if you will. Those of you that are impressionists, um, aficionados, you love the impressionist art, Monet, for example, or Renoir. Have you ever stood really close to one of those things? Yeah, they look like little dots, right? And you're thinking, I don't get this. But as you walk back further, the picture comes into view, isn't it? And that's, intu- that's how intuitive decision works. All right. <clears throat> so analytic and intuitive decisions. Let's talk about how they imply in life. You ever have a day where it feels like all you're doing is putting out little fires? See a lot of heads moving. But every once in a while, one of those little fires (laughs) sounds more like a barbecue, Lewis. One of those little fires explodes into an inferno. Have you ever experienced that? And then the question becomes, now what do I do? The pressure's on. Do you ever feel any pressure in your business? How many feel it every day? A couple of you. How many never feel it? I didn't think so. All right. How many don't like raising their hands? There you go. <laughs> All right. What we have discovered, because we study coaches that oftentimes are considered, and athletes as well, under a lot of pressure. It's interesting, they don't necessarily feel it that way, but it is. So what do they do that's different, that allows them to function under pressure? So I'm gonna talk about leaders. First, they're very good at filtering out distractors. When the heat is on, They only concentrate on the things that are most important. If it's not important, they don't pay attention to it. Next, they focus on the cause. Why is this happening? And they avoid the the symptoms. And here's the difference. If you are looking at all the symptoms, let's say somebody comes to you and they're complaining about how hard it is to work. Let's say, for example, your web designer is complaining all about this and this and this and this and this is why it's not going to work. And then if you talk to him or her for a little bit, you realize, you know, they just had something in their life 
that has taken more priority than your website. It's hard to believe, all right? But that's what happened to them. So what you're seeing actually isn't the cause of the problems for your website. What you're seeing is the symptoms of something else. So you've got to be able to focus on what's causing the problem. That takes deep knowledge, and that's why you're here. Because you want to know, let's go back to contributing factors. What are the contributing factors for your success? What's going to help you be successful in this business? And when you focus on those, when the pressure's on, that helps. Here's the other thing that you focus on. Go back to set your priorities and strategy. What are our core values? And you never give those up, ever. Because when you do, you've lost your anchor. And I'm not talking moralistically, I'm talking about your decisions. All right. Next, you prioritize. What decisions have to be made now? What can be made tomorrow or next week? Or actually never. What needs to be done now and how is it going to influence my next decision? You start thinking like a chess player. If I do this, then this is going to happen and this is what I'll do next. You mix the analytic and the intuitive. Now, if you don't get an intuitive response, you have to rely on the analytic. But if you get an intuitive response, see if the analytic supports it. So you try to use both. And you know, when you get something right, you know it, don't you? You just feel like, I nailed this. You felt this way, yeah? You can shake your hand, because I know you don't like to shake your head, or raise your hands. Yeah, or you can smile, great smile. All right. You're flexible and you change. Why is this important? Because it's pressure situation. Pressure means it's external forces, and they're constantly changing, especially in your business. And so as they change, you need to change. You can't use the same strategies tomorrow that you used a year ago or five years ago. You constantly have to evolve. That's how you keep up with the priorities. So. What is going to make you a better decision maker? I'm going to give you four options that we just discussed this morning, and I want you to commit to one. First, if you avoid bad decisions, just pick one, by the way, is that going to help you make better decisions? Or how about functioning better under pressure situations, maybe trying to prioritize decisions, be a little more flexible, mix the analytic and the intuitive? Or maybe you need to be better at analytic decision making, solving problems or setting strategies. Or finally, how about intuition? If you used your intuitive thinking more, would it help you make better decisions? Just pick one, and here's why. You could probably find something in all four of them, but the thinner you spread that, the harder it is going to be to change. So just pick one area. And if you would, share it with the person next to you or the two people next to you. What's going to make you a better decision maker next week than you are right now based on what you learned this morning? Go ahead. One of those four areas. And if you don't share it, you don't get lunch. All right. You've just shared with what you're going to do. Now share the person how you're going to do it. What are you going to do next week that you're currently not doing or haven't done that's going to make you a better decision? How are you going to make that happen? Go ahead. OK, you can, you can continue this conversation at lunch, which will just be in a few minutes. I have one question for Nick. All right, Nick. $280 million Wednesday night. What? of those four things is going to help you invest that money wisely. What are you going to do? All right, he's going to use his intuition a little bit more. I like that. All right, she likes that too. How many people like Nick's choice? All right, Nick, get their addresses down and you can email them. Yeah. All right, we've got, we've got a few minutes for a question and answer. Do we have some questions? Jeff, I know you've got a microphone. Caroline is running. Look at that. Any, quest any questions? Jeff? I'm just asking if anybody has any. You're not on. Yeah, uh, I'm not hot. Does anybody have any questions? You got it all. It all, you, you blew them away. No questions. I guess I did. Yeah, yeah we, we go. got Hold a question on. here. Here. Thank you. Everyone was just afraid to be the first. 
have you done any work with uh, transcranial direct stimulation? Have I done any work with transcranial um, direct, direct stimulation? stimulation? No, I haven't. We, our research doesn't really try to pr uh, provide an intervention. We really try to understand why people are successful. But I think that's, that's the kind of research that's really going to be groundbreaking in a few years. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to the dilemma between um, getting advice from somebody that's based on, you know, analytical decisions or their own intuition and then balancing that with the ultimate decision that you make based on your own intuitive tendencies? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, if I ask somebody, let's see if I have the question right. If I ask somebody that provides me analytic information and then another person provides intuitive information, how do I process each differently? First, yeah. And how do I balance that with my own feelings? First of all, I start with, and this is what I hear a lot of these great decision makers with, I try to keep my mind completely open. I want to completely understand what you're trying to hear me, without judgment. And then after that, then I can weigh the quality of your information. And I might look at things like, uh, what, how have you um, made decisions and what results have you gotten with those decisions? And I might even ask you for an example, how did that work for you, uh, you know, when you used your intuition? I will know this. The intuitive decisions can't come from somebody else. They have to come from you, because it's how you see the world, and it's going to how you interact with it. But the analytic decisions could be really helpful. Thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I got one right here, and then oh, I'll come all right. over. This is kind of a follow-on from that. I'm, I'm highly intuitive, and so far it's served me well. Am I better to try and develop my more analytic side or partner with someone who is natively analytic and balanced? Yeah, those. good question. Um, I would suggest trying to uh, increase the quality of your analytic decision making without r deteriorating your intuitive at all. Do not think you're doing it because your intuition isn't working. Do it because it's going to give you two weapons to deal with it. And, and here's, you just brought up a great point. The more that analytic decision makes you confident, gives you a stronger feeling, like I was right, the, the better it is. So it helps reinforce it. It doesn't detract from the intuition at all. Thank you. That was a great question. You guys are much more intelligent than me with the questions you're asking. I wanted to know, as far as male and female, are women tend to be more intuitive and men tend to be more analytical and that we should kind of balance the that's an interesting, I don't know if you heard it. Um, we often hear women are more intuitive and men are more analytic. That's cultural. It's not physiological. We, we raise people that way. And so women tend to res respond better to intuition because they've been reinforced that's the right thing to do. Now, I will also tell you this. I didn't tell you in the brain scans. The release of hormones is different for men and women. And so, uh, because the hormone balance is different for men and women. And it does influence the decision-making process. Uh, men are, are taught that you have to be rational. I mean, from the, the, and again, it's cultural, it's not physiological. You could train men to be more intuitive, you can train women to be more analytic. Yeah, so great question on there. I have time for one more question, anybody? All I know is that the women are usually right and I'm wrong. <laughs> 15 that, years of marriage. That's a man who's happily married. I can guarantee you. Right <laughs> so when you're talking about the backwards decision making and the forwards decision making, if you find yourself justifying things yes. and doing backwards thinking, what's right. a good way to pause that and reevaluate? You you just provided the answer. Just pause it and reevaluate. Say, am am I convincing myself? Because usually it's done by ego. Am I trying to support a decision I know is a bad one, that I, I made the wrong decision? Now, if you do the opposite and analyze it, said, if I had to start over again, what would I have done differently? Or here's another one, what am I missing? Because when we start justifying our decisions, it means we put blinders on. We only want to support that decision and not look at the other factors. Great question. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Shem. Can I end with one thing? Yeah. All right. I'd like to end with a poem, if you don't mind. Robert Frost, one of my favorite poets. He wrote, I shall be telling this with a sigh, 
somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Now, many people believe that that poem is really about taking the road less traveled. All right? And some people even say that's the name of the poem, but it's not. Look at the name of the poem, The Road Not Taken. When you really read that poem, the whole poem through, Frost even admits that it, when he looked at it a second time at those roads, he really couldn't tell which one was traveled more. So what he's really saying in that poem is not take the road less traveled, don't go where other people have not gone before. What he's really saying is that the decisions you make, regardless of which road you take, make all the difference. And it's my hope that this morning, I've shared with you some information that will help you make better decisions so that they will make all the difference. Thank you.